in five, four, three. Just as any child, I was very inquisitive about everything around me. The only things that truly set me apart was my exceptional ability to remember things, being overly observant and aware of situations, and speaking my mind, especially if it was something I didn't understand. There was a lot of stress due to illness that I witnessed from my divorced mother, which in turn was placed on my sister. So I learned very early to be patient, respectful, and a little devious if I wanted to simply be a kid. You wouldn't think that a child before the age of four could have true defining moments. But by then, I had three. I call this moment faith and trust. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, yeah. On this particular day, my mom and a friend from church decided to go to lunch and shopping. It was set up that the friend's son would babysit for a few hours while they were gone. When we arrived at the house, which was not very pleasing to me because I didn't have my toys and I remember seeing bugs there. After they left, he showed me his music and did all the typical get to know you tricks that you can do with a four year old when you're babysitting. I had noticed some comic books. And I started looking through one of them, but then under it was a dirty magazine. He saw my reaction and half giggled, but was hesitant to respond. When he got up to retrieve it, I realized now that this hesitation, it was to choose his words wisely. Don't tell our parents you saw this or you'll get in trouble. I can trust you, right? Heck, by that age, I rarely trusted my mom and really only trusted my sister. Now this being the most time I've spent with a male alone, I decided I would do as I was requested. So I sat there and he sat there with me and we flipped through the magazine. After a couple of minutes, he got up to go to the bathroom. So I thought, mom could have only been gone for maybe 25 minutes at this point and I was ready to go home. Something wasn't right, and I knew it. Just to get away from the magazines, I started looking around the room and getting a little more panicky and scared. But then suddenly, there was a comforting voice calling out, Bobby, listen to me. It wasn't his voice, and no one else was there. Bobby, listen to me. You don't need to be afraid. Trust your feelings. You will know the moment you can't handle what's going on. And when that happens, be strong and trust in me to guide you. As I audibly started to cry, the sitter yelled from the bedroom or from the bathroom to check on me and to bring him the magazine. Once there, he had me come in because he didn't want me out there alone. So to ease my anxiety, he decided to play a game with me. Tarzan and boy. (laughs) Well, while I was balancing, walking on the bathtub, I was very little as a child. (sighs) He shouts, the snake, it's attacked me and it's poisoning me. The only way to live is to suck the poison out. (laughs) Listen very closely to the next series of events. I looked at him while he was sitting on the toilet with his pants down and holding his erect penis. How did you do that? I asked. Remember, first teenage male I had been around, first visible erection on someone else, but it was big and not like mine. And again, I was very inquisitive, too inquisitive. He attempted to distract me while using my curiosity. Come on, touch it, and I'll show you how to get yours to do this too. I ventured closer slowly, and I touched it. Here's one way to get it hard. He put his hand on my hand and the other on my head and tried to pull me down. Now believe me or not, this is my truth. 
Without hesitation and in complete unison, the same voice came back. And together we said, no, I know what you're doing and I'm not ready for this. And it's time for me to go home. Now, I don't know where that strength came from, but I was looking at him straight in his eyes. In a feeble and fumbling attempt, he tried to scare me, then intimidate me. And when I wouldn't budge, forced me. But never taking my eyes off of him, I told him my mother was about to pull up and I'm going home. Disputing my words, they haven't even been gone for an hour, he said. I stepped into the bathtub and said with complete resolution, my mom is here. I trust the voice. Then he stood up, pants still down, and just looked down at me. We heard two doors close on a car. It was our mother's. He quickly dressed and grabbed the magazines, then went into his room. They entered the house, mom calling out my name. The car had broken down apparently, and she didn't want to chance to drive to the mall, so we were just going to go home. That night, I asked if the voice was still there. It was. We were still together, and it had a message for me. My faith and my trust would be rewarded at the right phases in my life. There would always be challenges, but never more than I could handle. I was being blessed with many gifts, one being able to love without boundaries and through the eyes of truth, and another is the ability to speak the truths of God or a higher power to those who are ready to experience it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Living in Truth. My name is John Paul Grosser, and I'm so excited to have you joining us here for our inaugural podcast. Um, this is something that's very new to me, and I'm very excited. But if you've made it this far, you've already listened to the story, and you know a little bit about me. And so what we'll be doing is investigating and breaking down uh, certain elements of my past and going into my present to see who I am and what made me who I am to this point. Um, joining me will be friends from then and here and there and all over the place. And so I'm very excited to allow you into my life to see more about me and hopefully what I have to say and what my friends can contribute will be able to enhance and enrich your life also. Joining me today, is a very good friend of mine, Patrick Bowles. And so I'm very excited. Let's see if we can get him on the line now. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you a very good friend of mine. This is Patrick Bowles. Hello, sir. Hey, John Paul. It's great to be here. It's great to Thanks have you Thanks for having here. me. Man, you are, you are, you know how much you mean to me. I love you to death. You've been a detrimental part of my life for the past. Do you realize it's been about 15 years now? Wow. Yeah, it's been a lifetime for some people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in our terms, yes, it has been a lifetime. <laughs> so, but um, I've already told the listeners that, you know, if you've made, if they've made it this far, they've already listened to the story. They know who I am. And what I, I my intent is, is for me and my friends to share our journeys and to talk, not a, not a comparison or to see whose testicles are the bigger or anything else or who, who's had the most trauma, but just so that we can each see that we've all gone through something. And although the situations may be different, some of the feelings are the same. And so I, what I want to do is break down and see where we are, how we've gotten to where we are, and um, what we can do to breathe and continue to breathe and strive further to become greater men and women. Uh, that we are understandable oh yeah that's great so before we get into that patrick uh why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself okay well i just want to say you know having heard your story let me just start there and say i'm just I, i'm really moved that you're doing this and that you're sharing your story having been through 
somewhat similar situations and now helping other people who are navigating these feelings from their childhood or other traumatic experiences. I know what brave, how brave you have to be to do that. So it's taken me many years to come out about my abuse and I see other people. It takes, it takes time and you're just really um, just going out there and doing it. So I'm so proud of you and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, man. Thank you very very much. Very brave, very, very brave man here. So, um, yeah, um, I, my name is Patrick. I uh, live in New York City, and I'm from Arkansas, though. So, and that's where I am right now, um, kind of um, steering clear of the pandemic. Yes. Um, and I, um, I'm a coach for entrepreneurs in recovery from addiction and trauma. So, I deal with people who have had some type of experience, who have, I mean, you know, when I say addiction, many times it's, we talk about trauma, the yeah. trauma that led us to there. There's like this, um, this hidden connection, this connection we don't quite understand between trauma and addiction or mm-hmm. just um, unhealthy coping mechanisms. So that's kind of the work that I do. I love that work. I'm the only business coach I know that likes working with clients like us. <laughs> True. So, yes, uh, I have not heard any others. Yeah. So uh, and that's the work that I've been doing. I went to... Um, you know, after we met, I went to school to be a life coach, and I have been doing this off and on for ten years. And along the way, started several businesses, and and now I'm just doing this is my this is my jam. I love doing this, and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm a helping person. Yes, so um, it's being able to do this full time is just been a blessing. So I love what I do. And Very happy nice. to be here, and and you know, help help you explore this question you know? Okay. Thank you. And I know that it's a, it's a question that so many of us have and not a lot of us face anymore. Um, especially men, uh, be you in the, be you LGBTQ or not. Um, this is something that we don't talk a lot about, uh, be it because we're ashamed, um, because it's giving up a part of us or something. But I think it's very important that we let it be known. Um, if not for prosecution of the parties involved, but to reduce the persecution that we give within ourselves. Yeah. So um, let's start out with, as we break this down, um, you know, let's start out with our home lives. I know with my home life, um, as I said, I grew up in a single parent family, um, middle to lower class, Um, lower to middle class Um, and you know mom struggled it was me mom and my sister and with my mom she desperately sought out male role models for me Uh, she really wanted to have someone that was a strong figurehead I mean my dad was in the picture but he (laughs) <laughs> that's a whole other podcast to be perfectly okay. honest. But um he he was there but he wasn't what I needed. And so and then in this first particular situation uh with the babysitter um it you know it was just an unfortunate circumstance that mom had run into and I and and, and she left me in that lurch. Now you said we have similar stories. What is your family home life like? Um, so I come from a, um, uh, my parents are still married, mm-hmm. um, middle-class family in the South. Um, all in all, a very loving situation, um, you know, with the exception of the molestation, I would say, you know, a very happy childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, growing up similar to you, you know, in the eighties though, we, um, you know, in this, you can imagine the eighties in the South, you know, yeah. and, um, I, you know, this, those first feelings of being a gay man or a gay child, you know, those feelings of to another, another man. And, you know, that is, you know, kind of overshadowed by the molestation by a family member, an extended mm-hmm. family member. So, um, for me, it was, um, a, you know, getting hit here by a fly so <laughs> we are in the south so yes it is springtime <laughs> yes. so um it you know it was an extended family and really you know that became neighbors as well um that um you know 
were predators. Mm. And so I would say it was, yeah, that's, that's my childhood. Um, my first memories are of un- inappropriate touching. So it started at a very young age um, by people that my family um, had trusted in me in their care. Mm. And um, they betrayed that trust. And the shame for me started almost immediately because I do remember being told, hey, if you tell about this, they're going to find out that you're gay. Right. They're gonna hate you. And you were, you're around the age of four also, if I'm correct, four, right? When yeah, it started. Yeah. When it started, yes. Okay. So it was the shame. It was the hiding. It was the darkness. I look back now and most of those memories are, um, you know, in a very dark and very obscure because uh, that's how we hold those memories. You know, it's a very dark place. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of my main philosophies about approaching trauma is that there is this feeling that I'm bad. You know, Mm -hmm. so um, and that 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 started for me at a very young age. And we see that, you know, if you watch SVU, there's a lot of hiding. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of this badness Mm -hmm. around it. So uh, and I definitely had that experience with it. Okay, And see, and, 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 and that's the unfortunate and confusing part for me, because as we spoke um, previously about this, um, it's almost like my it's almost like my life works backwards uh, for the fact that for me there wasn't shame there wasn't but then it wasn't as I don't want to say traumatic again if you know reading my story you see that I was able to find an inner strength uh, be it a coping mechanism um, you know I kind of in the story I kind of allude to it being a spiritual presence but something came to me and allowed me to speak up that first time that it started to happen and it stopped I was saved from my first situation um but then after that first situation like you said there were other influences that came along be it family members friends people in the neighborhood kids in the neighborhood that would do things also and and but i kind of chalk those up to we're all kids because they was mainly kids and so it's like are we experimenting you know what's happening but at the same time i did question why are they experimenting with me you know am, am, am i putting off that air of something um and so yeah so with with you and we've discussed this also as far as the molestation itself, I always felt that I was in control. And I know many people, I actually, I don't know of anybody else that has really felt that in their situation um, that they had control. Um, but then again, I honestly could be fooling myself. Uh, and, and, and I've said this, that maybe this is the, the defense mechanism or coping mechanism that I have as, as an adult now is to see it that way. But I mean, I know it happened that way. But what brought me to that point? How do you... So, so let me ask you a question on that. Like, what about that situation did you have control of? How far I let it go. That's what I felt. Um, because, you know, he would tell me to do this. He would tell me to do that. And why am I hiding what I'm saying? He would tell me to touch him and I would think about it. I remember thinking about, and like I said to you before, also, I was a very inquisitive kid. I'm a very inquisitive adult. He's like, touch this, touch my penis. And I'm like, I'm not sure about that, but I'm curious because it is bigger than mine. It is. Why is it so big? Why is it so hard? What? And so, and 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 so, I remember saying, "Okay, I'm allow that much," and so, and I did. But the those moments when it came to him doing things to me and starting to push it more, that's when I said, "No, that's not going to happen." And then that's when that voice came to me and saying, "You're safe now." tell them that it's over and I did and that's when my mom pulled up so that's why I always felt that I had control in just not that situation but in most situations after that 
Yeah, my experience of you is that you're a, a strong-willed person. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you talked about some of the um, head-to-heads we've had before. Yes. Um, so I, I can see that um, there is a piece, and, you know, this is just, uh, you know, you're asking the question, where does this come from? There is a part, though, of grooming um, with this type of abuse where uh, the, the predator is actually grooming you to feel like you're in control and to feel like you're True. a willing participant in the, in the abuse. True. Uh, that was definitely my experience. Um, I, you know, to even to the point that I thought there was a, uh, we were in a relationship, you know, mm. and that this is what love is. Yes. Um, and, you know, that's though, looking back at it, they're grooming a child with, mm. as a mind who hasn't, you know, is still very much in developing, you know, for many years later, I was still developing, you know. Right. So my, my, my experience is based on a mind that hadn't, you know, developed fully. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and that grooming can take a lot of different, you know, can look a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, but it's usually uh, something of a partnership and, you know, asking you and, and just the way you pose questions. Yeah. So, well, I know that by my third time, um, the third time that was the third time. I know. I'm sorry, not third. Second time, the second time that it um, happened, not with the same person, but with um, an educator. Uh, that's the most that I can say on that. Uh, he was grooming. He was definitely, and that's a known fact um, uh, that he he was grooming me. Because you know he was buying me gifts, it, he made it feel like more of a relationship type thing, um, and so that one I understood, and that one I he did allow me to think I had control, and I know that uh, that's when it start that's when it starts getting out of control for me because that by that time I definitely knew who I was, and that was when I was around the, uh, in the fourth grade, so I was about eleven. Yeah, that's 11. Um, What do you think as far as you, uh, because how did, like, I've already mentioned how I got out of that first one, you know, with my mom. Uh, The second one, I just called, I was like, all right, I see where this is going. I'm done. We can't do this anymore. I'm going home. I never saw them again. Um, For you, what was it that got you out of it? And what motivated you to leave? I mean, I know that you knew it was wrong and I knew it was hurting you because it wasn't just, if I'm, if I may say so, it wasn't just a molestation with you. It was something more that was more damaging for you. What, how, how did you get out of that? Um, For me, I was stuck in it um, for most of my childhood. Uh, you know, I, I was an adult before I came out about the abuse. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, w- I guess I can't change the past. I would have loved to have gotten out of it sooner. But th- that was, you know, there was this shame. I mean, my parents even took me to a therapist um, as, uh, in my teens, my early teens. And I sat there and lied about it to the therapist. Okay. And um, leaving, I was just wondering, I, I was... I was relieved that my secret wasn't out, but I, um, I was also just wondering how can he not see it? Like how broken I am, you know, because when you fall and you hurt yourself, your mom says, Oh my gosh, she, you know, there's a wound and we can see it. Right. This is it. She treats it. She puts a bandaid on it and we, it gets better. But with this kind of, um, abuse or this kind of pain, there is no physical wound but it feels like you're, it feels the same way. There's the emotional so, scar. The same, and we're not treating it. So why aren't we treating this? So it kind of even drives that story of let's hide this. It's hidden. Let's keep it a secret. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, so much it was tied into my sexuality because of what I was told and the grooming that I, that I received. Um, so, but as an adult, I saw this family member, this primary abuse predator, um, at a Christmas, family Christmas party, and he was exhibiting some of those similar behaviors of putting, ch- you know, children on his lap, um, directly on his lap. And um, 
I, I, I just, I said, I can't let this keep going on. And this right. time, this time I was 20 years old. I can't let this keep going on. I have to stop this. I don't want someone else to have this experience. So I made a promise to myself that in one year's time, I would stop it. Mm-hmm. And for me, that, that over, over that course of the year, like a depression set in because it was just the fear of this, you know, depression, which is very common with trauma, depression, and the and the looming anxiety of this promise I made to myself. Um, so I started to see a counselor in my university, and we worked through the Courage to Heal workbook. And uh, you know, I just I, I slowly came to terms with what happened. Um, and also understanding that it wasn't my fault that it mm-hmm. happened. Um, and I did come out to my family, um, first my mother, and then with her help, I went to all of her family members and told them what had happened to me. Uh, I went to the authorities and um, I, I was determined to stop it. Yes. And um, that, that, was, that was what happened for, for me. And I would say that was definitely a, like a defining moment in my life mm-hmm. of finding, knowing the strength that I had in myself to make it stop and to, to confront something that I was so ashamed of. Yeah. I know so many counselors um, are real quick to say because of a molestation uh, situation uh, that that is more than likely the reason why you're gay or this and the other. How much influence do you feel that that had on you? Uh, do you feel that you were damaged into being gay? Do you feel that it was a choice because of that? I mean, you know my feelings. I feel that we're born this way. I, um, but I also think that everybody is born with that capability. Hi, puppy. It's <laughs> a really good question. I'm just going to let them out, though, okay? Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi again. So, uh, in terms of your question of how much did this molestation play into my sexuality, I, I, part of me wants to say that you know, I was born gay and that's really the feeling I have about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't, I can't say though, it was so early in my life and it's so tied into each other that it, it's hard for me to say honestly. Okay. Cause see, in in all honesty, because my argument with that has always been, um, especially being a black man also, it's, it's, it's like, okay, if I'm ridiculed, if I'm hurt, if I'm degraded for being one way, or if I'm hurt in one way, why would I want to stay that way? In other words, if I'm raped by a man, if I'm this, that, and the other, or molested this, and the other, with that, why would I make a conscious decision to stay in that lifestyle? And so that's why I always say, no, it's a part of me, but it, 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 it didn't define who I am just like my sexuality doesn't define who I am. A molestation doesn't define who I am either. And so um, that's how I feel about it. And so, and especially with me saying, um, with me, with that, you know, that voice for me said to me, you're basically to become a minister. Oh, and by the way, you're bisexual. You have the capability. And it's like, wait, what? I'm four years old. Yeah, and so I'm like, hey, what? I don't understand what's happening here. But um, I mean, I would say that there was a realization. I do remember a realization that there was something different. It, it, it even at that point, I just knew something was different about that. Um, but I had the shame of you know being told right. that it was, and then I had just it being the '80s and the AIDS crisis, and you know True. being in the South, it was all I knew was that AIDS was the gay disease. Mm -hmm. And as a four-year-old, I reasoned that AIDS made you gay. Yeah. And so as a child, I remember four, five, six years old, thinking that I had gotten AIDS from my abuse. I'm sorry. 
I wasn't about to laugh. I was like, oh, that's kind of cute in a weird, goofy, weird, creepy in, way. But... In, a, in a child mind, right? <laughs> right, right. It's like, oh. <laughs> uh, I, I would say though that it, it wasn't a great feeling to have, no, though, no. you know, because it was a deadly disease. So that for me started this path of, um, you know, being an overachiever, mm -hmm. and you know, wanting to make my make my family proud while I was on this earth, so they would think of me as something other than uh, when I, they remember when I died as being you know, a good son. I keep forgetting our age difference. Uh, totally forgetting our age difference because I will say, you know, I I turned the big four nine this year. Oh, okay. I didn't realize you were that much older than me. I'm, I'm I'll be that. forty next month. Yes, I'm, yeah. So that's that's like cause so when you're saying the the you know you were a child of the eighties. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I was, I was getting ready to graduate high school. So it's but but and and and, and with us back then. You know, it, 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 those things didn't matter. We were still coming off of the sexual revolution, um, and so and 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 alternate lifestyles and everything else was almost okay, especially in the artist community. And it was, you know, for me, it was very clear that I was going to be an artist, uh, be it a dancer, singer, or something. And so that I was surrounded. I didn't have a choice. And so, but it, I think that affected me more than the actual things that were happening to me. Um, you mentioned you came to your family and you went to your family and told everybody, I applaud you for that. Uh, that that's a huge step because honestly, I, coming from a very religious family, that is not something that would even be dared to talk about. Um, I think that's a, another big part of my seeking out whatever voice this was to save me. Um, I didn't have the background of someone to go to as you did, uh, as a family, because I, I really don't know if they would have been supportive because I, I do remember there was one uh, member of the family of the outside family um, that came out as gay and everyone talked about him on the regular. It was, he was just this bad person. They would make these horrible derogatory comments about him. But here it is, I'm in kindergarten knowing that I'm bisexual and that I'm, I have a boyfriend and I have a girlfriend at the same time, you know, the kid. But um, I said I had no one to talk to, no one to say this is what's going on and I want it to stop um, because I did, that's the control that I didn't have. Um, I felt compelled and, and, and a part of this investigation also on top of being compelled to do something, to do things. And I think that's also, this is also where we differ because of my wanting male attention, affection, understanding you know my dad is not there and and so i'm want i was wanting i was needing that male affection and so i was okay with certain things and and trying to discover what it was to be loved um now you said you, you come from a, a, a dual family, meaning parents are still, excuse me, parents are still together. Um, this is going to be, this is going to sound like a horrible, horrible, horrible question. Was there ever a time that you felt that you wanted this to happen to you? Um, I, what I will say is that, um, like most children, I, I just wanted to be loved. You know, I wanted to give love and share love. And that is our, you know, really, you know, our naive, our mo most naive self is just to be in love, you know, and to, to receive love. I was made, I was told this was love. Yeah. So in, in you know, I, 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 yes, I sought that out. I wanted love um, and, you know, it did feel good. 
So there was that, that on top of it, but there's also the really a clear moment of that whenever I was just in shock after it happened. Yeah. Shell shock to my core, like knowing in a, in a, in, in a real way that something happened that wasn't supposed to happen, you know, yeah. that, so, um, I, and I, I mean, there were times afterwards that I returned to the abuse because I, I, you know, again, was just looking for love and to feel good. So, um, in, in a way, yes and no. Okay. Thank you. That was a very honest answer. And it's, it's like bringing tears to my eyes. I'm trying not to cry right now. Because that was just, I mean, because I do feel like I, I did saw it. I saw it. I did seek it. And well, I'm, I'm, that negative way, too. I saw it. And it just it was confusing. It was very confusing. Well, my question for you would be um, how much, you know, you first thing you said to me was that your mom really wanted you to have a, a male influence in your life. So how much of her desire was put on you? Were you hearing that or seeing that that made you ha also want that because, you know, we listen to our mothers? Well, that is why I never told her. To this day, my mother knows nothing of any of the molestations or of the abuse. She doesn't know any of them. And if she does, she hides it and doesn't know. Um, but no, I I never told her mainly because I want to, I didn't want to disappoint her because I knew how hard she was trying and I knew what it was that she was attempting. Excuse me. I knew what it was that she was attempting to do, and I couldn't find harm in that. And because again, she she wanted the best, and the people that she would bring around for the most part were amazing. The, like I said, the teacher. Um, he ended up taking me to everything. I experienced the symphony, art museums. I experienced uh, shows, Broadway, off-Broadway, cultural. Um, I fell in love with the theater. Um, I be he molded me, literally. And that's the one that, that was grooming me. Um, but but everything artistic, I owe to him. Um, and so, but and so, I knew what she was doing. So yeah, I didn't want to disappoint her, and that did influence me a lot. The wanting that love, um, and seeing her happy that certain things were happening, but she didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. So, um. Again, I know you're spiritual. We've talked about this already. Um, how do you feel that that has influenced you with your spiritual life or with your church life growing up? Were you a part of a youth group? Um, did you feel welcomed? Um, were you able to relate with others easily uh, despite what was going on in your life? My family wasn't at the time very religious. Um, I did know, and this kind of moves into my life as recovery from addiction. Um, you know, I did know that there was an emptiness, a hole in my heart, which I now know that there's a hole that I can either fill with drugs and alcohol, or I can fill with God in my relationship with my higher power. Um, I was aware of that at the time. I did go to the church, and my family is Catholic, so I did go to the church and try to find answers there. But again, I was just faced with this this other trauma, which I call is societal trauma, and this, th which is the concept that we are si society has told us that we are in some way wrong or bad for being gay, mm -hmm. and that's what I was faced with from the church so it was that's when for me at least the complex trauma began is that it was you know i i didn't have any way to really connect and i felt judged by the church so um it was a really a love-hate relationship i wanted something more um and i really wasn't able to to find that connection 
So it was only later in life when I came to accept my sexuality and I came to understand my concept of God and, um, you know, this relationship that I, that I want to have and this relationship that I was born to have with God, um, that I was able to fill that hole with something besides sex and drugs and alcohol. Um, so, you know, and getting to the person I am today, I would say that's an integral part of it because the way I believe it is if God is everywhere, then God is also in me. Mm -hmm. So if God is in me, then I need to act like God would. And I hope that God is a forgiving God. And that means I also need to be a, be a forgiving man. So and that, that forgiveness has been a really important part of me getting past the trauma that I've been through. Mm -hmm. um, and now, uh, you know, being able to share this message with other people so that they can also heal from their trauma. I don't Where think would every, go ahead. I was going to ask, um, a, a lot of AA, a lot of self-help groups, um, uh, part of their mantra is you also have to figure yourself first also, correct? Oh, certainly. Yes. And so how is it when you're forgiving yourself, what is it that you're forgiving yourself for? In terms of, you know, well, part of it is the damage that you, you've done to your body and to your relationship with the people around you. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be the, the short answer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I am speaking very generally because I know for me, when I, have to, when I say I have to forgive myself, um, I know for like certain situations, it's me putting myself out there into the situation to allow that to happen. Um, and, and, and this is up to me being an adult for a second, you know, I, I the the I allowed myself to do certain drugs. I allowed myself to be placed in a abusive friendship, all so that I could have that whole field of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and and those are the one things that I have to forgive myself. And so, and I think that's why I'm doing all of this is to figure out what even brought me to that person. You said that I'm a strong-willed person, and we all know that I am, but. As I'm getting older, I almost have to say to myself, is this an act? Has this all been an act because I'm so weak and damaged on the inside? Um, because, dude, seriously, the past few years, you, if you were here, Patrick, you would slap me with that big hand of yours. And I know that you would because it's like, why was I allowing this person and that person in my life and I, I i i track it back to to the four-year-old me of saying oh because you know the voice god my my inner spirit has control and they're gonna take care of me um but it didn't i it's like i <sighs> Like I said, it's like a backwards thing. It's a circle for me. And it's, it's not like you. I've I've regressed as I've gotten older uh, to the point where I don't realize that I have the power to take care of myself. I have to have someone else. And, you know, there have been trace elements all through life with that. And, and again, I don't know if it's because of that loneliness but it's that voice that I heard, and I'm kind of getting off track a little, and I apologize. No, but I like that, where it's going. Uh, it's that voice that always kept me questioning my strength. I believed in myself because I believe that I am God also, as we spoke about. In order for God, in order for us to totally embrace what that inner light, that inner being is, or that outer being, we have to accept and embrace the inner being. But then we also have to accept good and dark all together. And I've always had trouble with that. I did not see the darkness. I just saw the light and that light could penetrate anything. If I wanted it, if I believed it, it would happen. But now I'm at a point where 
my light isn't bright. Um, I, I blame myself for everything I've gone through, which I should, but at the same time, in taking responsibility for the situations and the things that I've placed myself in, such as when I was a kid, it confuses and allows other people to take advantage of that situation because they can't cast blame on themselves either. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, from, you know, in so many different ways, I don't even know how to, how, where to start. Uh, you know, you talk about responsibility and I, I really strongly believe that, you know, that we have to take responsibility for our part in things. Yes, yes I was a, uh, I put myself in this situation and, uh, you know, I drank too much and that ended up in a situation that I regret, you know, and, and, and you know, being harmed, for example, there's more story, more to that story there. Mm -hmm. I put myself in my situation. I drank so much. I was incapacitated. This something happened, right? right. I was responsible for that. However, we're talking, you know, about a child. Yeah. Who doesn't have that mental capacity to think that. And for many years I had that philosophy. I actually had a coach told me, take responsibility for everything. You know, that was, that was her philosophy. Well, that played into my childhood. And I was like, well, I could have told someone, you know, mm -hmm. so I am, a, I am partly responsible for what happened to me as a child. But I now understand that that's not the case. And in this case, I was purely a victim, you know, a victim that was taken advantage of because they were um, not, I was not did not have the mental abilities. So put yourself in a child that you know in, at, at the age of four. Would that, are they responsible if someone t touches them? No. Absolutely. Just like I wasn't, just like you weren't, you know? And, and then you talk about the light and the dark. I think if we would do some, some regressive work, like meditation and visualizations, mm -hmm. that you and we went back and looked at that four, your four-year-old self, you have locked that child in a dark room. And I would invite you to open the door. Pick up that child and bring them into the light. Integrate with that child. You know how um, in so on social media, I have my different personalities. I have Bobby, I have JP, John Paul, I have Jay Pizzle. I don't know if I've ever told you, and I think maybe one or two people know this, and I apologize. Um, that's what that is. Those are certain types, certain personalities um, that I have split myself up into to protect myself. Um Bobby is the person uh, that everybody loves, you know, from growing up. You know, he was a strong-willed, um, artistic, powerful person um, that a lot of people loved. But there was something timid about him, but it just wasn't the same. But then there's the very little-known Booby. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my nickname was growing up. Um, wow. For the first time, I'm going to say, I don't believe I'm saying this all right here and right now. Um, but Booby Day, that was my nickname growing up. And I loved it. It wasn't anything negative. But um, Booby is the child that you're talking about that's locked up and is afraid to come out. And I know that. Um, but my sister's... Mm, my sister said something to me the other day while I was writing this and preparing for this um, podcast. Um, and that was, I wish I knew what happened to you when you were three, year old, three years old and stopped being a child. And this is what it was. And I know that, but how do I tell her that? I mean, she knows. But she doesn't understand the impact that it had. And she doesn't understand that that's the day that Booby Day was locked up in that closet because he couldn't be a child anymore. 
and then some Bobby took over. Um, I kind of forgot <laughs> where we were. I'm so sorry, but um, you were talking. Yeah, you were talking about you know the different faces that you wear. Yeah. Um, to to protect yourself and yeah. I, I had another good friend who would constantly say, it's all the same person. They're, they're still the same person. And I understood that they were the same person, but they each held something sacred. And I don't, I, I'm sorry, I just had a moment of what would happen if I were able to put them all back together? Would that complete me? Would that make me a whole person again? I mean, I mean, it's, the the three older ones, you know, John Paul, Jay Pizzle, and Bobby, uh, they they have so many similar characteristics. Characteristics they mainly are there to, to either protect or to enlighten or to you know, like John Paul. John Paul is the minister. He's the one that is. Oh, I got to make sure I do this, that, and the other right, and everything else. Yes, I falter. I'm going to falter, but I'm going to be strong for the rest of them. Uh, Jay Pizzle is the go-getter, the person that if he wanted a movie done, he would say, this is what I need and this is what's going to happen and it would be done just like that. Um, in order for them to understand each other, I know that there's a great level of forgiveness that we were just talking about that has to be done. My friend, I think I need to ask you a question and that's simply, how do you forgive yourself when you don't think that you're really worth forgiving? Because I don't understand myself. And, and, and there's so much that I see that doesn't make me happy that needs to be forgiven. I've never hurt anyone. It's not like that. I've always been good to everybody around me. It's I've done the most damage to myself than anyone could ever have done. Mm -hmm. Where do you start? I would say this is... Um, when I work with someone who's coming into a program of recovery, um, I say this is step point five. This is before we even get started. We have to, when we come into the, you know, come into recovery, we have to forgive ourselves for, for what we did to ourselves and how we betrayed ourselves. Um, it's, it's a question of dignity, getting your dignity back. And I can imagine that that's, that would be really difficult for you, um, given your spiritual life as a minister, you know, that that would have a, like an even deeper, um, uh, it would be even a deeper, deeper work um, to, to get dignity. And I know at least I can speak from my experience when I, when I decided to really live a life of recovery and to start to heal from all of this, um, it was, that um, finding dignity and living in dignity. Um, in answer, my question for your question is, what are you forgiving yourself for? Um, <laughs> for being thirsty? No, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there's truth in that. Um, for never allowing the love that was there to be enough. So be it, you know, from my sister and my mom, my uncle or my uncles, it never being enough, uh, always wanting more. Because uh, even though I knew like my dad had wanted nothing to do with me, I still sought after that love with all of my heart up until I was 17. I did everything I could to have that love 
And when I couldn't get it from him, I sought it out in other ways that were not productive. And so I need to forgive myself for that because that's why I say I hurt myself. But, and, you know, recently my dad died uh, two years ago now. Um, and that's allowing something else to happen um, because I, forg I was able to forgive him um, for not being able to love me. That's something else I need to forgive myself for. The arrogance that I was able to acquire because of that. Because I ended up saying to myself, I am beyond capable and beyond worthy. <laughs> Your puppy is really cute. And beyond capable of loving myself uh, completely. But then I fooled myself by saying, I don't need anyone else. And I think because of that, I automatically and subconsciously will push so many people away. Um, you know, I've had three relationships in my entire life that were worth anything. Uh, and so that's what I would have to give myself for loving myself in a way that was not productive and pushing away the ones that truly love me. I know, puppy. And I feel you too. I mean, she looking straight at us. So I was like, <laughs> I'm like, I got you. I feel it. Um, um, you know, I, the way I feel about that is we were created to be in a loving relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And then we were ripped, ripped from that relationship and put on this earth in a world of lies of scarcity. And, um, you know, this, the world is out of relationship with God and it's, it's our challenge to return to that relationship, but there's no, you know, there's no real clear guidance that we each individually return to that, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're left trying to fill this void that God has, that, that this relationship has left and we do our best, you know, we see how other people and then, and then, you know, unfortunately some of us, had these traumatic experiences which literally changed the chemistry of the brain yeah. so we're left you know trying to find this without all the capabilities that were get were, that were meant for us so we do our best and it's we're always looking for this deeper constant relate this deeper loving relationship but it's hard to fill it unless you know you know, we're godly men, unless we really truly return to that relationship with God on our knees in humility and say, I surrender to the power of this love and let it fill you and then work your ass off to make sure you stay there at God's side. And it's, there's so many confusions for me when I looked for that, to fill that, I was faced with a church that had a very different belief thoughts on how we do that, you know, mm -hmm. in a relationship, you know, some in the churches that are, you know, judgment and um, sin, and it's just such a loving relationship. So I guess I would say even forgiveness, even before that is having compassion for yourself. Like how can you have, look at yourself with compassion. In this case, we're talking about a, and abuse it four years old how can you have compassion for that four that, that four-year-old bobby boo <laughs> for what he went through i'm hearing you know you asking to take responsibility for that situation and looking you know and wanting to have control or like trying to find how you had control of the situation reality is is you were completely out of control yeah. The, the, the Bobby Boo didn't have that ability to know right from wrong. You know, he had this gut, he had this spiritual experience that brought your mother back, which thank God for that. Yeah. But you, you know, it's, it's that kind of compassionate, loving relationship with yourself. And I mentioned if God is forgiving, I need to be forgiving. Well, if God is compassionate, I need to be compassionate.
and compassionate for that little boy who's locked in a room in the dark to compassionate enough and empathetic to bring him out. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. It really does. And I do believe that I have the tools to get there. This is going to take time an investigation and inquiry. Um, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, do you have a final thought of anything? And before you even say give a final thought or anything, I want to say I would love to have you back as often as you like. Sure. Uh, to, yeah. To sure. talk more because this was really good. My sister asked me, um, yes, or this, just before the phone call, um, if I was feeling better from yesterday. And I was like, I talked to Patrick. Yes, I'm doing a lot better already. And I know that I'm going to feel even more great after this, is, after this session is done. And so, yes, what are your thoughts, uh, final thoughts for yourself and for myself uh, and for me and for anyone that's watching or listening? Well, I will just say I, I, my dogs are normally very well behaved. <laughs> we got the postal, postal worker, the UPS worker. We got neighbors <laughs> walk through beautiful days. So I apologize for our listeners. Um, I wish I could see, see. There she is. So maybe you can have a little compassion. Yeah, I see her. <laughs> um uh, you know, this is this is very deep work, and it it's t work that takes time. I mentioned going to see a counselor whenever I was twenty. I'm forty now. Yeah. I still see a counselor. I still do work. I'm doing deep work. I'm journaling every morning. I'm going to AA meetings. I'm doing. I am really just obsessed with taking care of myself and getting better. This is a lifelong work. Um, but what has happened is I have a deeper understanding and now I see it as a gift. Um, you know, four years ago, we started a high school here in my hometown. I moved back and we started a charter high school. I worked with kids. I was able to look at them and immediately say something here, there's something here or something we need to talk about. Yes. I can see it on your face. I can yes. see it in your energy. I know this. And I was able to sit down with children and get them into therapy, getting them to see a professional by just simply saying, you're not alone now. Yes. You were alone then. You're not alone now. You were in the dark then. We're in the light now. And you're not alone. I've been through it. And I've been able to help other people with this and this is a gift post-traumatic stress disorder is a superpower we feel things in different ways now and we see things in different ways and we know how to harness them you like superheroes there's a training ground you know mm -hmm. the danger room of the x-men they have to go in there and have to practice these powers yes. and we do that and you're in a situation where you're able to help people through your ministry through your work with, um, you know, talent and from Hollywood experience and things like that. I invite you to see how do you channel that fireball and make a difference. And you're doing that now, both with deep inner work and also sharing the word and sharing this power, this, this experience with the world. So you're taking the first, we just take it one day at a time and one foot in front of the other and make the best decision we can today. And right now we have the internet, we have webcams, we have a yes. microphone, we have headsets, we have dog barking dogs. We can make a difference. And yes. I think that's really just be proud of yourself for getting up, making this happen, and making a difference. You're unbelievable and an absolutely amazing power force. Thank you, my friends, so much for being with me and for uh, sharing your wisdom and your story and all things Patrick Bowes. Um, Speaking of, if you want to catch me, it's patrickbowes.com, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-B-O-Z-E.com, Patrick yes. Bowes. And then you do have a book coming out soon. Yes, I do have a book, 12 Steps to Business Breakthroughs, Entrepreneurs in Recovery from Addiction, Trauma, and Crisis. And we will be talking about that more on a future cast. So again, thank you so much, my love. And I will talk to you very soon. All right. Take it easy. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.